strategic accounting, convertible bonds, and accrued interest. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of St. Louis Test Preparation. Here's our email and our phone number. And a good site for this demonstration was taken from a university um, PowerPoint presentation that we found regarding convertible bonds. And also the Wiley.com site, we use the Keysco and Wygant um, example again. So we, we're on types of bonds in the last um, video, number 12. And if you look at the bottom of the page here, we started talking about convertible bonds. And by that we mean we're going to take debt, a bond is debt, and we're going to convert that into stock. So we're going to go from having a creditor, someone who owns debt, to someone who is an equity owner and has stock. So I've gone over to my convertible bond example. And the, the why question, the answer to the question why, you would convert from bond to stock is to change from debt to an equity investment. And I've defined it right here. A convertible bond means that the owner, in this case Bob Smith, has the right to convert the bond, the corporate bond that we have here from IBM, into a fixed number of shares of stock. And in this case, I've said on the bond certificate itself here that it's convertible into 100 shares of common stock. <clears throat> Why would Bob Smith want to do that? Well, it may be that because the market price of both the bond and the stock have changed, that the stock is now worth more than the value of the bond in terms of market value, how people value it right now. The other reason might be speculation, that Bob Smith expects IBM common stock to increase in value, therefore he'd rather own the stock than the bond. An income investor, someone who lives on the interest payments would keep the bond, Someone who's interested in growth might um, speculate by owning the stock because they want growth. So in my example here, I've given market prices. And I've said the bond is now worth more than the $1,000 price. It's now worth $1,200. Why would that be? The reason is, as we saw in the prior video, that interest rate, when we talked about callable bonds, that if interest rates decline, let's say, 10-year bonds are now being issued at 6%, the 7% bond is now more valuable. And as a result, the 7% bond goes up in price. So I just made up a price for the bond, and I said it was $1,200. The common stock, I valued 100 shares that he's going to get upon conversion at $13.50. So the common stock value is $13.50. And that market value is more than the value of the bonds right now. The method that's going to be used is called the book value method. And the book value method, when we do this conversion on IBM's books, says that we're not going to have a gain or loss upon conversion. And the other thing that should be noted is it is a non-cash transaction. Cash is not affected by this entry. So the journal entry is to pay off the bond and issue common stock. So you can see that we took our bond payable, our liability, and debited it to decrease it. And we decreased it at $1,000, which was the value on our books, the $1,000, the original face value, the amount that you saw on the bond certificate when it was issued. You may remember with common stock that when we look at that on the equity section of the balance sheet, it's in two pieces. The first is, is that we have a par value, a value that's assigned to the stock when it's first issued, and in this case, that's $5. So $5 times 100 shares is 500. The difference between the liability that we took off the books, the $1,000 debit, and the par value of the common stock that Bob Smith is getting as an owner, the difference we plug here to additional paid in capital. And when I say plug, I mean that we have to come up with the remainder of the credit side of the entry so that the entry balances, because we're not going to recognize a gain or loss. You can see that in this journal entry, there is no gain or loss on conversion. If you look down here, we noted that the price of the stock is $13.50. But in our journal entry here, if we add the par value and the additional paid in capital, we only posted a credit of a thousand, which means that that $350 difference was not recognized 
as a gain or loss. And the reason is, is that market prices are subject to change. And that to be conservative, let's not assume we have a, a gain because it, a gain or loss because the market prices just might as easily change. So we're not going to record it to be conservative. Because oftentimes in accounting we talk about the basic rule that we're going to record things at their historical or original cost. We're not going to record things at market value because they're subject to change. That's not true through all of accounting. But that's a rule for a lot of assets in accounting. And again, it's to be conservative. Now, we can make this um, call can be seen as a negative by the investor. Call premium. I want to jump over to accrued interest and at least start that before we end the video. Accrued interest. The definition of accrued interest is, is that accrued interest is interest that the buyer of the bond pays to the seller. The reason this happens is in blue at the top. It's when a bond is sold, we have a buyer and a seller, between interest payment dates. Bonds trade in the marketplace just like stocks and other assets. And most of the time when they trade, it's not going to be right on a bond interest payment date. Interest payments from the bond issuer IBM can only be made to one party. But the problem is that two parties own the bond during the, in, during the period of interest. So you can see in my example that the bond pays on June and December 15th of each year. Well on June 15th we paid Bob Smith, the original owner, the entire $35. $1,000 times 7% times 6 months. On 9-15, Bob sells the bond to Joe Brown. And since Joe Brown is the owner on December 15th, the issuer, IBM, pays him the entire $35. But the problem is, is that Joe's received six months of interest, but only owned the bond for three months, from 9-15 to December 15th. So the solution to this is that on 9-15, when that bond is sold, the new buyer Joe Brown pays the seller Bob Smith the three months of interest that Bob Smith has earned between June 15th and the time they make the trade on September 15th. So Joe pays $17.50. Joe gets back that $17.50 on December 15th when he gets the entire interest payment. So Bob ends up getting his three months worth of interest and Joe Brown gets his three months worth of interest, which is the difference between the 1215 payment of 35 and the 1750 that he paid to Bob Smith. That's the end of part 13 of our video. Here's our YouTube channel. We have monthly small group live chats that are inexpensive on the first Saturday of every month. For one-on-one -on -one live tutoring and chat sessions, here's our website, our phone number, and our email address. We'll see you next time.